welcome. I'm Nelifa. This is Dear World Live. How do we uh, construct our economy in a way that is climate friendly? It's two times as difficult for disabled people dealing with COVID than it is for their non-disabled peers. How do we actually ensure women's inclusion? How do we ensure women's safety? Hi, hello, and welcome. It's me, Nella Hidayat, and you are streaming Dear World Live, brought to you by Doha Debates. I am so pleased that you are all joining us today, this important day. Of course, it's International World Health Day. And today we're going to be talking about healthcare and the disparities that exist and the differences in healthcare between the global north and the global south. More about that later. But Every episode of this season of Dear World Live, we are looking at issues through a very specific lens. We want to know how we can bridge divides. How can we talk to one another? How can we talk about issues in a way that is fair and that limits the divides that separates us? Now, in a moment, I am going to be joined by my esteemed guests, Dr. Cheryl Holder, who is a climate, health and equity advocate, and Dr. Vikram Patel, the co-founder of the Movement for Global Mental Health. Before we do that, though, let's set out the grounds and the situation that we are talking about because it is very severe. Life expectancy, for example, is a key indicator. And unfortunately, it shows a huge divide when it comes to thinking about healthcare around the world. For example, someone in Japan can have a life expectancy of 84 years. If you so happen to be born in Sierra Leone, for example, that drops to 55 Maternal mortality is another really important indicator and the gap between rich nations and poor nations shows that divide. For example, in low income countries, they account for 99% of annual maternal deaths. So in all of the world, 99% of annual maternal deaths are in low income countries doesn't get any better when it comes to children. Children are 14 times more likely to die before the age of five in sub-Saharan Africa than the rest of the world. 14 times. Of course, healthcare is just one important contributor to these indicators. Things like climate change, food poverty, industrialization, and even conflict all impact these realities. Now, it's important to say that despite those really heartbreaking numbers and statistics that I've read out, there are creative and innovative healthcare solutions that are being devised and adopted in countries all over the world. Something to be hopeful about and something you'll hear more about soon. Now, Dear World Live is a show that is nothing without you, my wonderful audience. I am so glad that you could join us today on International World Health Day. And I want to hear from you. So wherever you are watching from, uh, make sure that you use the hashtag Dear World Live uh, and get in touch with us. We are across all the social platforms and channels uh, at Doha Debates. Remember to get in touch right now uh, and tell me where you're from, where are you watching this from uh, and who you are. Just a note as you're watching this that during today's show we will mention uh, mental health issues. Now if this is an issue that impacts you and you want some resources to help, go to dohadebates.com forward slash global health, which you can see on the screen right now. Right, without any further ado, it's time to begin. I would like to introduce my wonderful guests. Dr. Cheryl Holder has dedicated her medical career to underserved populations. She's a fellow of the American College of Physicians and co-chair of Florida Clinicians for Climate Action, which aims to increase awareness of the impact of climate change on health especially for vulnerable populations. Dr. Vikram Patel is a core author of the Movement for Global Mental Health. He's a psychiatrist and researcher who has received many awards for his work and child development and mental disabilities in low income countries. But that's not all. I am indeed joined by a student and our audience member, fan of the show, 
This week is Dane Marie Balbiran, an American Filipino nursing student studying on Bohol in the Philippines. You are all so welcome to the show. But before we kick things off and we hear from you, I wanted to share something. We uh, reached out to our audiences around the world and asked for their personal stories about how they have to deal with healthcare inequality life, where they live, inequality where they live. And one of our audience members, Tomas Ramirez from Mexico City, shared their experience. And I would really love for you to take a listen. Men in Mexico City are considered to be having this facade in front of them of strength and are not allowed to be vulnerable in society. It's very rare that men in Mexico, especially the place where I live, seek for mental health. Um, mental health help. I struggled for a, a couple of years with, with issues of mental health, um, depression, anxiety, and, and it led me to, to really not being in a proper place. Um, adding to the fact that I am part of the LGBTQ community, at that point of time it was different. It was not the same thing that is happening now. Fortunately, the government and some organizations and some people have been noticing that this is something that needs to be changed, that needs to be done. And at the moment, there are programs uh, for people that, that me in the past suffered from this and are helping them to, to be happy in life, to move on. And it's a work that it's important and it needs to be done. Work that is important and needs to be done. Tomas Ramirez, thank you so much for sharing that, your experiences in Mexico City. Dr. Patel and Dr. Holder, I want to speak to you both uh, about Thomas's experiences, and it might have struck a chord with you. But Dr. Patel, to you first, you work in mental health uh, across various sort of areas. What's your experience as a practitioner when it comes to healthcare inequity? So let me start, first of all, by acknowledging these powerful words that we just heard from Thomas. Uh, and, I, and I really feel a great deal of compassion and empathy for, for him and indeed millions of people who uh, find themselves in very similar circumstances. Let's, let's start by just framing the issue. What is health inequity and disparity? It's basically the idea or the observation that some people enjoy better health than others solely because of their wealth or privilege or some advantage position they have in society. And addressing this injustice is at the heart of global health. Now, while it is true that, you, as you mentioned earlier, uh, that some of the largest inequities exist between the wealthiest countries of the world and the poorest, actually, there are enormous inequities even within every country. Uh, and I think Thomas's example is, is extremely relevant there. These inequities are, of course, not just about how much money a country has, but also the kinds of conditions, health conditions, or the groups who are vulnerable, who are addressed by those resources. Typically, for example, mental health issues, issues that concern sexual minorities or other minority groups, issues like health promotion or community-focused care are systematically discriminated against in every country. And these... I would love to hear a personal example, uh, Dr. Patel, uh, in, in what you've experienced. Can you tell me a time when you witnessed yourself healthcare inequality, when, especially when it comes to those minority communities? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, the, the best example I have is of HIV care. Uh, you know, I, back in the mid 90s, when I worked in Zimbabwe, because HIV was associated with groups of the population that the moral majority thought were, you know, responsible for their own ill health, they were actively discriminated against. And that's just one example. Another great example is in my work in Boston right now, the way we, uh, the system discriminates against people who are opioid users, uh, because this is seen as something you brought on onto yourself. Now, Dr. Holder, I want to come to you next. Minority groups have to deal specifically with their own set of challenges. But in your practice, what, what inequality have you seen in communities that you serve? Um, well, thanks for having me. I'm sharing an office at the Corona vaccine site today. I'm doing vaccines. So wow, I, it's all happening. Yeah. It's all live. It's all real. Right. I, my 
I sometimes have to when somebody comes in. So I think I'm safe now. Okay, well, I'm in, in Miami in Florida, in the United States, the rich countries, but the same disparities that we talk about happens here too, for much of the similar reasons, poverty. And of course, the United States has some historical reasons, which we can't deny, because we can be ahistorical in how the systems oppress. So in our society, many black and brown people are at the bottom when you think about how slavery and racism has impacted the United States. So I see it on a day-to-day -day basis in that here in America, just with the coronavirus, black and brown people have paid a huge price for with this infection in terms of um, not, not solely just who's infected, but who dies from it, who's lost more economic power because of it, who's lost more housing and jobs and continuing. So and we're I looking love, at- I love yeah, what you've done here by actually thinking specifically about the intersections when it comes to healthcare. It's easy for us to pigeonhole people and groups and illnesses, but oftentimes, especially with something as personal as your health, it can affect all parts of your life. Now, I wanna talk about something not so much specific on minority communities, but every person watching this stream live right now, climate change, the climate crisis. Dr. Holder, you're based in Florida where some of your work is focused on the relationship between the climate crisis and health. And I think in fact, we have some uh, images there of you doing your good work, doctor. Uh, you're holding a climate protest sign there. Can you tell us what you're doing there and a little more about the link between climate change and the healthcare as you see it? Yeah, that was a protest at the right before the presidential debates because we wanted the presidential candidates to make sure that climate was front and center. Because for our population that I care for and the rest of the world who cares for poor people, climate change impact on the health is now. It is not 50 years from now. It's not just buildings. It's not just sea level. It's not just infrastructure, but it's the actual health. And I tell you about my patient who woke me up in 2016 when she came in for medication refill. And a simple refill of asthma medicines unearthed a whole story that showed that she lived in inferior housing. She couldn't keep her place cool enough, so it triggered her COPD, worsened her, her health condition, used up her medication, not, not enough money to pay either her light bill or her medications. She came in to me to get some help. to see what can I do to get some light bill covered for her? And what can I do to help cover her cost of her medication? So that's when I realized all these hot days and nights, the shortening of the allergy season, the pollution that my patients were experiencing were impacting us right now. And what are we supposed to do as clinicians, as a society? And it's not simply just recognizing people, but addressing climate change. I could not have put it by myself. You are absolutely eloquent in the way that you've explained that. Thank you so much. I'd like to bring in Dr. Patel at this point. You work in the area of mental health care specifically. In fact, you uniquely spend your time between India and America. You have an incredible vantage point, and I want to tap into that. You must see so much of what we're trying to talk about on the show today. So what do you wish people would know about the differences in mental health provisions uh, in, in places like India and America? What do you wish we would know? To be honest, I don't think any of your uh, listeners and myself would expect any similarity between India and the US. After all, one is amongst the poorest countries in the world and the other is exactly at the opposite end, one of the richest. One has only 5,000 psychiatrists for 1.3 billion people, while the other has nearly 40,000 for a population a quarter the size. So you might think there's nothing in, in, in common between these two countries. In fact, I have observed some fundamental similarities in terms of inequities. For example, the importance that is given to mental health in the national policy agenda, but more importantly, the way the healthcare system addresses the needs for people with mental health problems. For example, despite the amount of money the US spends on mental health care, here's an incredible fact. More people with serious mental illness find themselves in the prisons of this country or on the streets of this country rather than in healthcare settings. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And to make yeah, matters I mean, worse, okay. the pandemic is going to further threaten the mental health uh, of people in this country, indeed, all over the world. 
And this is this is exactly why we're talking about it today on Dear World Live, because we understand that healthcare and access to healthcare, it doesn't matter if you are living in the world's wealthiest nation, if you're living in certain areas, that access is, is removed from you. You are watching Dear World Live with me, Nella Vahedai. It is International World Health Day. And to mark this important day, we are talking about healthcare disparities across the global north and global south. I'm joined by my two wonderful guests. But you, you are the most important guest. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for streaming the show. We are at Doha Debates across all our social channels. What do you make of the discussion that we're having so far? Do you see healthcare disparities where you're from? Share your story with me. Tell me your comments and your questions. And I will get as much of that into this live stream as possible. I'll give you one more warning before your time is up. So just tell me what you're going through um, and I'll try and get that in the show as much as I can. Now let's turn our attention to somebody who's been listening uh, all along. Uh, you, you're right there, um, Diane Marie, sorry, my script's gone just very funny. Uh, Dane Marie Balbirin, an American Filipino nurse student. You were very nervous before this broadcast. No need. I have messed up for the both of us. Um, now it's time to talk to you about the amazing work that you do. You're talking to a young audience who are all connected and you're on TikTok doing it. I hope in a moment we can see some of your really uh, thought provoking, but also entertaining videos in a moment. Well, I want to understand why do you make these videos? What's the reason that you make them? And what has the response been? Initially, I made these TikTok videos as a coping mechanism. Um, the pandemic kind of caught all of us on off guard and we immediately had to adapt to learning on online modalities, which nursing was not made for. And I just needed a distraction and TikTok offered that distraction. And I realized that the more verbal I became about what I was feeling or like what I was going through, the more people resonated with that content. So I felt a little less lonely and that just encouraged oh. me to keep going. <laughs> and I built up a small community on my TikTok where we just support each other and we encourage each other to keep going, even though there are so many reasons why it'd be easier to stop. Exactly. And this is what I just find so encouraging by what you're doing, Dane Marie. It's just incredible to see that despite the difficulty um, in terms of talking about these issues in the way that we are, you're persisting and you're making it fun and hip, as I understand <laughs> it. Now, uh, your TikToks are wonderful for your audience. People can definitely uh, tune in to watch those. But I want to know, you actually uh, grew up in the United States and are studying nursing in the Philippines. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you're studying nursing in the Philippines. Do you have a specific question for our guests to answer? I do. So from what I've observed, a lot of students are choosing nursing so that it could be at their ticket outside to uh, outside of the Philippines. Like in other words, they'd like to find work abroad. And um, this is still happening today. I have my batchmates that are in nursing for the same reason. Um, can you tell me what impact this type of brain drain has and what can be done to mitigate these issues, especially in the under, underserved areas of the global south. Who do you want to ask first, Dane? Um, I'd like to ask Dr. Cheryl Holder first. Hi, yeah, the brain drain, you know, unfortunately it does happen in that the US because of the pay scale does recruit nurses from all over the world, especially the Philippines. And I've worked with some incredibly Filipino nurses um, at all the hospitals that I've been in. And it has benefited our community because one thing that's real is that many of the hospitals that are most short in the United States are often the hospitals that serve the underserved people, the poorer communities. So having skilled, well-trained nurses has been beneficial in improving the health outcomes for the population. So that is sad that one country that's poor is losing it, but often the poorer communities in the newer countries you're going to have benefited. So in a global sense, you're often serving many of the similar poor people just in another part of the world. So we thank you for the service, but it oh, would be best if we could equalize it and make sure the Philippines get the care too. 
Doctor, hold on. I've got to stop myself crying every time I hear from you because you are so solutions oriented, which is what we are about. Uh, I'd like to let Dane ask. Um, well, no, Doctor Patel, please do answer Dane's question. So yeah, you know, I won't repeat what Cheryl has said, and I agree with her. But in my view, moving to a wealthy country is not only about the attraction to leave home for a place where one will often be a second-class person as an immigrant doing a job, as Cheryl described, that locals don't want to do, but more often also because the country you're leaving has very difficult working conditions, poor wages, discrimination, and political instability. And I'd suggest, Dane, that it's these push factors that we also need to be paying attention to. Stopping the brain drain must involve countries like the Philippines, making it far more attractive to stay at home and be a health worker. Dane Marie Barbarian, was that satisfactory? Yes. <laughs> I could have said it better myself. The idea of the brain drain, because, you know, I'll tell you a little bit of my own internalized racism or, or whatever I have, I have to address it. When I first heard that you were a Filipino American nurse, I automatically assumed you studied in the Philippines and you came to the US. And in fact, your story is the opposite of that. Do you often have to explain that to people? And what do you feel about it? I do actually. Um, when I first moved here and did the whole introductory phase for all with all my classmates, they were really shocked to figure out that I came from the United States and I chose to come to the Philippines. But I guess what a lot of people don't understand is that even though there are so many great opportunities that school in the States can offer, it's also very expensive. And I honestly did not have the financial capacity to shoulder the full tuition. And so the next best opportunity for me was to move back to the Philippines. And I love it. Um, not only am I getting an education here, I'm also able to experience my Filipino culture in a way that I've never been able to experience it before. Wow, that's really interesting. I've got a question specifically to do with underserved communities around the world. Where I'm from uh, in Afghanistan, I'm from Kabul. The fact that I was born and my mom lived uh, is pretty much a miracle because in Afghanistan, the maternal mortality rates are horrendous. So when we're talking about such basic needs not being met in terms of healthcare and that divide between the global north and south, one of them is simply seeing a doctor. I mean, I've got two here in front of me and I'm blessed, but often in some countries, it could be thousands, if not 10,000 people per Doctor, I mean, that's incredible. Dr. Patel, I want to come to you first. What, how can we even address this issue when there's 10,000 patients per doctor in any country? So, Nilufar, one of the things I want to emphasize is that the U.S. has more doctors per capita than anywhere in the world, but the U.S. has also the highest per capita mortality from COVID than anywhere else in the world. So I don't think you should automatically correlate the number of doctors in a country with good health. I think good health is actually largely about addressing the social determinants of health. For example, good housing, sanitation, uh, pollution in the air, and so on and so forth. Doctors play a very important role, but I don't think we should over inflate that role when it comes to uh, comes comes to population health. And the second thing I want to say, which is a real opportunity that comes from global health, is the reimagination of providing healthcare through non-physician providers, for example, community health workers. This has been one of the most successful strategies for reducing maternal mortality in places like India uh, and East Africa. So I think we need to continue to invest in creating more doctors, but we should only be doctor-centric in our thinking about healthcare. Dr. Holder. Yeah, I agree 100%. Um, the social determinants of health, where you live, where you work, your money, your access to politics and power is what determines your health. But in that, the coronavirus, again, has given us an example, I think, of another opportunity, which is telehealth. And there's one good thing that the world has done, even in some of the smallest areas, you do have cell phones. And that may be what we've seen, my patients, because again, I take care of poor people in America. And the telehealth, we just call, has made a difference. My show rate, I do HIV um, patients also, and my show rate has skyrocketed because I can call them. I had a patient, I was talking to the grocery store because they work during the pandemic, they had to get home, but I could still check in on them. So I think telehealth may give us an opportunity to expand care 
and focus on the social determinants of health, which is what will improve your health outcome. Educating girls, educating women, educating small women farmers to produce more food. That's what's going to drive improvement in health outcomes and not simply increasing doctors, but community health workers, nurses, all the clinicians have a role. And I think technology will help us. This is this is absolutely what I want to hear. Don't always go to the doctor. It should be community care. Okay, it's time to get to some of your comments and questions as you have been feeding them into us here at Dear World Live. Uh, I just want to read some of those out. Eugene Rosenquist got in touch via Twitter and it says it could be deliberately corrupt governments which create these situations. Again, speaking to that idea that healthcare is not just about what happens in the doctor's room or the surgery uh, or the healthcare facility, it's what happens all around us. Another one coming in from Qatar University College of Medicine, Yasmin says the COVID-19 crisis has made the disparities in healthcare access even more apparent. Universal health coverage is one proposed solution to ensure that these inequalities are eliminated. Uh, UHC is the only solution available to better healthcare access for vulnerable populations. And is it really realistically achievable on a global scale? That's a really important question. I, I want to come to you first, Dr. Patel, about this idea of a UHC. Um, do, you, do you support it? Is it even possible to bring it out in places like India or China? China with a population over a billion. Yeah, absolutely it is. I have absolutely no doubt at all. It's about political will and money. <laughs> the amount of money that we are spending on the military in every country of the world on defense budget completely would take care of universal health coverage for all our people. And it's a, it's a decision that we as people and our political masters have to take. What's more important, arming ourselves or promoting our health? It's fundamentally a political decision. It's not a question about money. Dr. Holder, you were nodding so fervently, I have to get you in here. I, don't, yeah, I think you're, it was worried for your neck momentarily. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, it's not about money. If you look in the US, we spend more on the last six months of life. That's where a lot of our healthcare expenditures go. So it's not money, it's political will and understanding the social determinants because where Europe, which has universal health care, they spend more on the social safety net, which is what gives them the better health outcomes. So we just need to reimagine healthcare, who's delivering it, where do we put our dollars, and we can get universal coverage for the entire world. A question for both of you, and I know that you're both gonna disagree with me, uh, but, how can we possibly get governments on board? They need to make sure that we are fed, that the roads are paved, that uh, people have access to education. Why should healthcare be a priority? I'm not gonna let you fight it out amongst yourself. Healthcare is about social, mental, physical. It's not simply your genetics. So when we talk about healthcare, we are talking about the fabric that brings up humanity. It's what the fabric of makes us as humans and makes us as a society and makes us a community. So as we address decreasing pollution, that's a health solution. As we talk about improving food, that's a health solution. If we say eat more vegetables and less red meat, we are saving the climate and we're also giving health solutions. So again, it's looking at health in a global holistic way. Um, heat worsens mental health. But no um, one's so listening. No one's right. listening. You guys could be shouting to your face. You're blue in the face. No one's listening to you, Dr. Patel, Dr. Holder. How are you working to try and get the ears of the politicians and policymakers? Because everything you said makes sense, and yet hardly anything you said is being implemented. So, Lilifer, you know, I, I, even though I think, as exactly as Cheryl has said, that health is a fundamental right of every human being, I don't think that's going to carry much weight with, with our political leaders. What really they want to listen to is does health relate to the economy? And this is why governments are very much quicker to invest in infrastructure or in, and, and, you know, in economic uh, investments. If there was one historic moment to demonstrate how health is intricately, intricately related to the economy, it's the pandemic. Every country's economy has been shattered by the pandemic. The global economy has been shattered. This has to be seen as a unique historical moment for every country to commit itself to investing in its health sector. 
Okay, I want to get Dane involved at this point. Uh, this part of the show is usually what we say for the solution section, because at Doha Debates, we are as much about the solutions uh, to a problem as we are about talking about the problems themselves. So thank you to everybody who sent their comments in. I will shout you out as we go on, but my guests are too wonderful. I've just got to speak to them. I haven't got time. Dane, you've heard about some of those solutions. Going old school, like... Tele uh, telephone and radio broadcasts that can talk about public health uh, and maybe looking to democratize health and taking healthcare outside of the GP surgery or the surgeon's uh, theater. What do you make of the, of the solutions offered by Dr. Patel and Dr. Holder? What do you feel about it? Is it practical? I think those solutions are very practical. Um, the solutions that Dr. Cheryl Holder enumerated just solidified the fact that health truly is a multifactorial phenomenon. Like it's not just due to one thing. It's not just due to your genetics. So a change in your lifestyle, a change in your habits can do a lot for your health and your overall state of being. Okay, then we're coming to the nearly to the end of the show. So one big one for my doctors who are clearly very busy and want me to bugger off so they can get back to saving people's lives. At Doha Debates, we are solutions oriented. And this year, we're focusing on bridging divides. And one of the ways we wanted to engage you is to ask you, what is one thing, big or small, that is currently being done to give us hope that the healthcare divides are narrowing? Dr. Holder, you first. I see it again, educating women and girls, and Dane Marie is a perfect example. All the data clearly shows that when we educate women and girls, we decrease pollution, we increase our responsiveness, decrease in the number of children, we have better health decisions, the families are better protected, women invest more in families than when we do men, so educating women and girls across the world will benefit our society and improve our health outcomes. Dr. Patel, what about you, Dr. Patel? What do you think? What are we doing, well, big or small? I, I, I will get, again, I completely agree with Cheryl, but I, I'll give another another big uh, idea, I believe. The pandemic has taught us that the much trumpeted idea of solidarity of countries is a complete mess. As wealthy countries have once again cornered most of the world's supply of vaccines for their own people. So if there's one thing which I believe is needed to narrow the healthcare divide is to heal the divide between countries. The countries have become more and more inward looking and insular in the last year. And we need a renewed push to strengthen the partnership between the community of nations. I want to end by saying the pandemic has taught us that no person in any country is safe until everyone in every country is safe. If we are truly one world, then we must look beyond our own borders to create a better, healthier and safer world for everyone. <sighs> Last one to you, Dane. I can't come up after that. Um, I really agree with what Dr. Vikram Patel and Dr. Cheryl have suggested. And as a student nurse, um, something that I think will co help contribute to these solutions is to just continue studying, continue educating. And um, I think that the more we learn and the more that we study, the more we'll be able to, the more creative our solutions will be. So just and increase our knowledge. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Dane Marie Balberian, Dr. Vikram Patel, Dr. Cheryl Holder. It has been absolutely wonderful to have you on my show. I hope to see you soon. Goodbye. Say goodbye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye Thank bye. you to my exceptional guests. I was wrong numerous times. I learned so many things. I think we have all been given um, a lot of food for thought. I want to get to a couple of your comments that I couldn't earlier on. Um, Avisel Diaz Tunit, tuning in from Florida, um, was uh, talking about lawmakers needing to take to address the negative health impact of climate change in low income communities. But as we've heard, oftentimes politicians don't care about things that are going to affect us in 15, 20 years. They care about 
voting in two years and four years. So getting people to engage with that is really tricky. I want to say thank you to everybody tuning in from California, from Ethiopia, from Western Sahara. What a delight to have you. I'm going to see if I can get these comments up. Yes, hello. Um, I'm waiting the program for Western uh, Sahara. We've got people tuning in from Ethiopia. It's such a delight to have you. Um, just looking to see what's going on here. There's lots of support from Dane Marie from the Philippines. I can see those coming through. People watching in from Venezuela. Thank you so much, Franklin. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, people watching from Doha, thank you so much. I hope we answered a lot of the questions that you might have had. Um, and really, th the main thing to think about here is the importance of taking care of each other in a community setting. We live in an age of a pandemic. Times are hard and we will be living through difficulties hereafter. The most important thing to do is to look after each other. Now that is all the show I have for you for now, but there is so much more. Uh, we have a lot of content just around World Health Day and the amazing shows that we've made about it. Uh, the conversation does not stop here. Find out more about Doha Debates and what we uh, are doing and, and putting out there by going and seeing our newsletter. That's at dohadebates.com forward slash newsletter. And we've also just wanted to let you know that if some of the things that you've heard about, about mental health have struck a chord with you or impact you, then we have some resources available. Uh, please head over to the World Health Organization website, which you can see right now, um, to talk about mental well-being. That is the end of this episode of Dear World Live, but we will be back next month on the 3rd of May for an episode marking World Press Freedom Day. I will see you then. Goodbye.